so my first talk will be about AWS pills from hell. Unfortunately, I do have significant experience <laughs> with this topic, uh, not just in Dashboard, but also previously. But um, the, the story, I think the, the most painful story that I have on this topic. Uh, so we had a NAT gateway incident in Dashboard in the really early days uh, when we were uh, just starting out. We didn't have, um, obviously, not too much of a budget. Uh, it was in 2019, and uh, I think in January or, or in February, I came to work one day and uh, saw the bill of like over 40,000 <laughs> in the morning. Um, and the majority of that was actually because someone um, accidentally uh, routed all of the traffic through uh, NAT gateway. So um, like we had a VPC set up with like a couple of EC2 instances and we were processing uh, all of the log data from our customers, like tens of, of, of terabytes uh, plus our own internal communications uh, plus the logging that was pr being produced in our EC2 instances. Uh, also all of the interactions with databases, uh, with, with like uh, MongoDB, with, with DynamoDB, everything actually went through uh, this unfortunate NAT gateway, uh, which is hugely expensive. Uh, so we got the 25K bill just for the NAT gateway that we, or like just for the transfer costs of the NAT gateway uh, that month. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> Didn't discover it uh, before it was too late. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately we had uh, AWS credits at that point. Um, so that kind of softened the flow. Uh, it was an easy fix for us as well. So at the same day, we, we reworked the, the infra it did not ever need to go through the uh, NAT gateway, but we didn't read, uh, we didn't pay too much attention to the pricing, didn't think too much about it. It was just like a, like a mistake. Uh, so that happened to us. Uh, obviously as a serverless monitoring company, uh, we've seen those kinds of incidents in other companies, uh, our customers as well. We try to help them. We try to uh, make uh, all of our customers aware of uh, the costs that are um, ramping up and, and also try to help them with it. So um, a kind of a list of common mistakes that we've seen um, is the costs for services you didn't expect, uh, which is obvious, but um, what we see happening a lot is that uh, you kind of look at like the CloudWatch logs or you look at data transfer, like you, you never actually look at it. You look the EC2 instance cost, for example, or, or you look at something else, but then there's like a couple of other pricing dimensions that you don't maybe pay attention to, or you're not aware how much they are actually increasing. Um, in, in a lot of cases, we see this with logs as well, when people start logging out huge amounts of data, um, like for instance, cloud watch logs gets really expensive. Uh, data transfer also uh, across regions uh, can ramp up. So those kinds of unnoticed things happen. Um, the other thing we've seen a lot uh, is surrounding service costs or like when you look at like a serverless API or something built on serverless, uh, kind of the instinct coming from like uh, containerized workloads is that you look at mainly the cost of the compute and uh, the databases uh, and storage, obviously. But in case of like serverless, uh, API gateway can cost you a lot of money, um, like messaging, like SQS queues, a lot of those services that you kind of might not account into it uh end up costing a lot uh, sometimes or in a lot of cases a lot more than the the compute part uh of your application there's uh, like yeah that happens a lot um there's a couple of ways to to understand this before and a couple of ways to uh, prevent this i'll go over that in the next slide um the the other thing uh the third thing we've seen a lot is over provisioning uh, this happens a lot with EC2 instances, uh, especially when you're just building out your, you're just like, you know, doing the first version, the second version of a, 
of an application and you just don't spend too much time uh, going into which like is the best optimal instance type, for example, or how much uh, memory a Lambda function should use. Uh, RDS instances, there's tons of opportunities to over provision in AWS and that is a huge uh, cost sink that uh, we've seen. Um, we've also seen, um, and that has happened to us, uh, for, for getting services on. <laughs> so um, like spinning up staging environments or uh, spinning up an entire environment just to run a test or a test like a certain feature and that stays on for extended periods of time, uh, ramping up costs. Uh, so be mindful of that. Uh, the horror story of the next talk is actually about recursive Lambda functions. Uh, we've seen them uh, running amok. I think the problem isn't just even recursive uh, because those can also be used like um, in a normal way, but it's uh, waiting in code. So you have a function that's calling another function, but it's waiting for the response. And then you end up with a chain of like 10 functions doing that. And that ramps up costs as well pretty quickly. Um, also, uh, what we've seen is uh, people committing uh, AWS credentials to public GitHub repositories, which is obviously not just the cost, um, a, a cost risk, but um, we've also seen that uh, incurring up tens of thousands of unwanted costs. So be wary of that. There are crawlers that con like constantly always are searching and scanning for uh, GitHub public repositories for um, for credentials, and then um, those credentials are used to to mine crypto, for for example, or or to something else. Uh, so what we do to avoid surprises and kind of to stay on top of things. After that incident, uh, like that we had with the NAT gateway, we started reviewing costs uh, biweekly at first, just to kind of uh, reduce the risk of uh, of getting that surprise. Or if something that we do is wrong in terms of like cost savings, uh, then we find out about it in a week or two, uh, not at the end of the month. Uh, second thing, you can quite easily actually set up billing alarms for uh, in CloudWatch and in the cost explorer of API um, in the AWS API. Uh, another thing is understanding the cost structure of your environment. So where are you actually spending money on? Uh, is it like the databases? Is it the compute? Uh, is it like uh, messaging? Is it uh, maybe like monitoring or operations or DevOps. So understanding that um, enables you to look into if you can make optimizations. That's the first part is um, you shouldn't just go into, hey, which Lambda functions are over-provisioned uh, if the total cost of the functions are like $10 a month and your databases are costing you thousands. So you should start always where's the biggest kind of pain. Um, also, another thing is that uh, you should know or kind of have in the back of your mind which costs are fixed, uh, that like they're unlikely to change. Um, if you have like a small ECS, EC2 instance that's doing certain amount of processing for something, but it's not changing, it's not dynamic, then it's probably not going to surprise you if you have a, an on-demand database or some sort of a service that um, directly relates to the customers. And if there's like some sort of a spike somewhere, it directly um, incurs costs, then you should at least be aware of that. Uh, one of the, the common things we've seen is that uh, uh, locking uh, actually costs a lot to store in CloudWatch, for example. Uh, but it's super easy when you're debugging to add new log lines, add like log out the entire JSON objects. Uh, and that will like end up being terabytes of, of logs monthly, and and that's a uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind and and uh, communicate across the team because it can happen quite a lot. Uh, try to evaluate or kind of get the sense of how much things would cost uh, before you actually start building on them. There's an AWS cost 
calculator uh, where you can actually uh, model the, the cost or kind of do an estimate. You just insert what you're building, which services you're using, how many requests you're planning to get. And it will give you a quite big picture of uh, the services. And you know what we've done to, to cut costs quite a lot is just like choose always the correct services or the most optimal services. So there's a lot of um, different variants of how to build stuff. And, and if you choose the right services, it will most likely save you a ton of money. Um, the last part is uh, like, the vendors or kind of the whatever you attach to your AWS or um, like somebody getting uh, basically having access to deploy infrastructure to your AWS or just to make API calls. So that can also uh, increase the cost. Uh, like uh, Dashboard, uh, we are building a lot of stuff on um, like as a vendor, uh, but we are really mindful of not incurring any extra costs of uh, to our customers. So the added cost, even for like really huge uh, environments in Dashboard is like less than $10. It's in like usually less than a dollar in, in our case, uh, but some vendors actually uh, query your uh, metrics API like every, every two seconds. And uh, that can cost a lot of money. Uh, sometimes also, the data transfer is cross regions, which can cost a lot of money. Um, also, some, in some cases, infrastructure and EC2 instances are or something is deployed under your AWS account as well, uh, which we don't do. And that can also actually uh, build up costs significantly. Uh, so how to optimize? Uh, we've seen that it's almost always starts with identifying where you're actually spending the money on. Uh, so this is kind of like multiple levels. This first is what services. So if you look at your AWS pill, if you look at like what which services you're dealing with, like is it databases? Is it like DynamoDB? Is it like SQS? Is it functions? Is it something else? Then you should look into like, okay, why is this costing me so much? Can I do this in some other way? Uh, is this kind of what's expected or is it not then like this is how you kind of um, track and kind of find optimization opportunities uh, the other part is um, you look at like not service based but you get a microservices based overview so which business functions of your application are actually costing you the most is it like maybe some service that's like internal is, is costing a lot of money um, you can tag the resources and then you can look at the pricing based on the tagging of the resources, which gives you an overview of uh, like how the costs distribute across uh, different applications. And obviously like, you know, if you have everything on, on serverless, uh, for instance, you can use Dashboard to look at which functions in, uh, in your AWS are costing you the most and how to optimize them, like which give you the biggest uh, opportunities to optimize which parts are over provisioned things like that um, the other part is considering alternative services so when we started out um, and this has been my experience with different companies over time is that uh, you kind of uh, have a fixed tool set of things that you can actually that you use or you're used to and those not uh, might not always be the best suited for the, the job at hand. Um, so, you know, be mindful of what database you're storing different types of data to, uh, what compute services you're using, uh, what messaging and, and storage uh, services you're using. So in our case, um, we were actually massively able to reduce our bill. Um, the, the majority of the uh, of the bill kind of savings uh, came actually from uh, storage and databases. So we're handling a lot of metadata in real time, like billions and billions of events. We're doing um, like hundreds of thousands of different metrics that we're tracking everything in real time. Um, so at first, when we started out, we were using MongoDB for everything. So all of the, the metrics all of the user data, everything was actually in MongoDB. Uh, we've since then um, 
started using different uh, databases for different uh, types of tasks. For instance, uh, DynamoDB is for, for metadata, uh, TimeStream is for metrics, and that has gotten the costs like incredibly um, actually to, to a pretty low uh, cost structure. Uh, the other thing was uh, processing. Uh, we've moved a lot to, to lambdas. We were like over 50% lambdas always, but uh, since kind of the, the year and a half ago, uh, when we kind of made the switch for the data processing engine, we actually saved uh, really significantly on that as well. And we changed the uh, structure and the kind of uh, like architecture of the infrastructure quite a lot as well to avoid um, a lot of unnecessary work that we were doing. And uh, yeah, you can really, really got it down quite a lot, at least in our experience. Uh, but like uh, accidents still happen, unfortunately. Um, you can uh, reduce the number of them, but they will still sometimes happen to you. Um, my first recommendation when you kind of, when something happens that you didn't expect like something crazy happens, uh, not just when you kind of, you know, uh, have a lot, a lot of users and you're looking to cut down like the, the cross margin. If you have an accident, then contact AWS uh, through the support. If you explain what happened, if it's like something that's kind of a mistake and it's an obvious mistake that uh, that won't happen again, or kind of you you understand what happened. They can actually forgive you. They can uh, remove the the cost line um, or reduce it. Uh, what we've also seen is that mostly they don't do it uh, more than once. So uh, if um, yeah, just be it like um, be mindful that if you kind of get them to <laughs> forgive you once, they, not, they might not do it again. Uh, the other thing is if you're a startup, if you're like early in the cloud journey, uh, try to get uh, credits uh, because those soft, soften the blow and those let you experiment uh, to mistakes. And, and that's, it will happen more when you get started and, and less when you're down the line in the journey. So credits can actually save you a lot. 